I was very blessed to attend a wonderful college, Vassar College, which is in Poughkeepsie, New York. It was the first college founded to educate women in the United States in 1861. And it was founded, strangely, by a brewer named Matthew Vassar. I don't know what exactly made this brewer so open-minded that he wanted to educate women, but I'm glad that he did. In 1979, Vassar started admitting men, so by the time I was there, it was co-ed. But it had a wonderful celebration of women as a sort of a part of the culture of the place. In fact, the biggest administration building that also was a dorm as you enter the campus was called Maine, Maine Hall. And the hallways in Maine were very, very wide because the women in the 1860s had these huge dresses that just went out so far and they had to be able to pass each other in the halls. So the halls were really wide. My grandmother also went to Vassar, but she was kicked out because she got married, God forbid. When I started at Vassar, my grandmother said, oh good, you can finish what I never got to finish. Make sure you go to Gracious Living, she said. Gracious Living was tea at four o'clock in the afternoon, which when my grandmother attended Vassar was mandatory. When I attended Vassar, nobody went. Who wants to go to tea at four o'clock in the afternoon when you're busy? Evidently, Jane Fonda also went to Vassar and they required you to wear white gloves and pearls to Gracious Living and it was still mandatory when she was there. So she went one day and didn't have her white gloves and pearls so she was chastised. So Jane Fonda went the next day in only pearls and white gloves and she was <laughs> expelled too. <laughs> One of the things that I learned from my grandmother is etiquette at the tea table or the dinner table. And when you're sitting there with a, a cup, a teacup in front of you, and, and someone, a friend, offers to pour for you, you are supposed to say when. You're supposed to stop them when the exact amount of tea reaches the level that you want in your teacup. And that would depend on whether you wanted cream or cubes of sugar or both, so you had to sort of calibrate, but it was your responsibility to say when. And if you didn't say when, well, the server could keep on pouring and it would just go all, the, all over the table, so you had to watch. And you had to say when. Today is a very strange holiday in the church. You know, when, you, when we think about it, we celebrate the day that Jesus came among us on Christmas with all of the strength and might that the church can muster. We have people that come from all over the place, people I've never seen before come on Christmas during regular times. So we celebrate the coming of Jesus with great fervor, but when it comes to Jesus leaving, well, the holiday sort of takes a back seat. In fact, the holiday is actually this past Thursday, but no one wants to celebrate it on Thursday, so we push it to Sunday. And there's no great celebration at all. It's sort of, in fact, the, t the church gives you the um, option not to celebrate it at all if you don't want to. Because in a way, I think there's part of us that wishes Jesus had never left. Why should it be a celebration that he left us? What's so good about that? I mean, wouldn't you want Jesus to keep on popping in in the resurrected form in our lifetime? I mean, it would certainly make me nervous, even more nervous than an IRS agent at the door, but I still would long to see him. But no, Jesus appeared over a period of 40 days, and on the 40th day, he literally was lifted up into heaven. He left, and he left publicly and in front of everyone, 
and for a very good reason. Because Jesus needed to say when. Now it's strange, the ascension has got mixed reviews from the writers of the Gospels. Matthew and John don't mention it at all. Mark just mentions it sort of at the very end and passing as if maybe he's hoping you won't notice. But Luke, Luke the physician who wanted people to be healthy, Luke stresses the ascension. In fact, Luke mentions it twice, not just once but twice. You know, Luke is two volumes of one book, the first being the Gospel of Luke, the second being the book of Acts. Luke covers the scene of the ascension both in the end of the Gospel of Luke and again in the book of Acts just to make sure that we get it. And the disciples are, are with Jesus and they're on the Mount of Olives and the disciples say, okay, Jesus, are you going to set up the kingdom of Israel now? Are you going to fix everything? Is everything going to be made whole? Are you going to do the Messiah thing now that you've risen from the dead? Are you going to take care of everything for us? And Jesus says, when? It's your turn. My cup is now full. I have done everything that God has called me to do. And now I need to leave you so that you can become the fullness of who you are. If I stay more, it will overflow and I will not be doing what God wants of me. It is time for me to say when. Jennifer was an only child, and her dad was a raging alcoholic. He ended up dying early of his alcoholism, and she and her mother did everything to take care of him. Her mother worked full-time to pay all the bills. They were always trying to take his car keys away and trying to take the bottles away, and they did everything they could to always be caring for him, and he died as they cared for him, and they were exhausted and overwhelmed, spilling out all over the place. And sure enough, Jennifer, because she didn't know about boundaries and she didn't know about codependency or addiction, she went on ahead and married an alcoholic because that's what she knew, and she did the very same thing, and she worked full time, and she went and rescued him when he got stuck or when he was too drunk at a bar to drive home, and she did everything she could to keep the house clean and cook for him and clean for him and pay the bills. And her life just spilled out everywhere and she was exhausted and resentful and felt sorry for herself and she was miserable. And she had a nervous breakdown and finally went to a therapist who said, Jennifer, you need to learn to say when. There is a time for you to care for others and there is a time for you to stop. There is a time for you to say that you have done enough. There is a time for you to leave some room in your life for enjoyment, for sleep, for caring for yourself. Yes, God wants you to serve others, but you're not supposed to do that indiscriminately, letting it flow everywhere and make a big mess. You have to learn to say when and so gradually she got the strength and went home and said to her husband, I'm not going to keep rescuing you. You have to stop drinking or I am going to leave. And it was the hardest thing she ever did because she loved him. And she thought love meant doing everything for someone. But the problem was when she did everything for him, he never got well. He acted like a child. He made himself sick with his disease. 
She did have to leave because he wouldn't stop, but after she left, he finally got help and got sober, and she could come back, and they could learn how to have a healthy relationship with one another, where both of them from time to time would say, no, I can't do that, or I'm too tired to do that, or I need to go do this instead. And Jennifer gradually began to realize that leaving her husband was the most loving thing she had ever done because it forced him to get well. And that's what's so strange about this holiday, about the fact that Jesus left us out of love. He left us because we were saying to him, okay, are you going to fix the world for us? You go ahead and do that, and we'll just be like little children, and we'll watch you make everything good. And he knew that that wouldn't be what was best for us. He knew that he had to say, when my time is up, it is time for me to leave so that you can become the fullness of who God has called you to be. So long as I stay and do things for you, you will never know who you truly are. My friends, for those of you faithful believers, one of our greatest temptations is not that we're going to not serve Christ or not care about people. One of our greatest temptations is that we'll never stop and care for ourselves. Or we come to this myth that it's up to us to fix the world. God has called you to a particular cup. God has called you to a particular life in a particular way. And you are to do exactly what God asks of you, and no more, and no less. Think of your life, and think of ways that you can both serve God and also say when, so that you can serve God more. A few days ago, I was walking by the river, and I saw this fish. It just jumped out out of the water. It was one of those glorious mornings, you know, when the sun is beginning to rise, and this silver fish just jumped out of the water, sort of dancing in joy, and then went back in again. It was so beautiful. And I thought to myself, that's kind of like Jesus. I mean, we had him with us for three years. He came out of eternity and he was with us, joyful ministry, and then he went back to God. And really, that's our lives as well, isn't it? We have a, a certain period of time in which to do exactly what God has given us to do. And then we too, we're going to have to say goodbye. And we have to tell our loved ones that, that truth so that when it happens, they're not crippled too, expecting us to do everything for them but that they understand it is the way of God's grace, that each of us has our time in the sun, our, our day to dance, and then we go on into God's kingdom where we belong. What is your cup? And when is it full? How can you learn to tell? How can you learn to say when? Jesus not only taught us how to live and how to love, he also taught us how to say goodbye. Amen.